Okay, thank you for that introduction, Beth. Uh, and yeah, we're going to go through some uh, some opportunities today regarding saving energy with operation and maintenance. Uh, hopefully, you'll find some gems in here that you can apply in your facility with your company. So, let's see if I can get this slide. Let's see. Let's start off, uh, we'll just talk about our goals today for this webinar and um, some things we hope to, to, to impart on you and, and cover. Uh, so first off, uh, we just want to talk a bit about uh, understanding the value of O&M improvements. What are these uh, changes? Um, you know, generally, they're, they're going to be things that, that are low cost, uh, perhaps no cost, um, so there's, they're definitely attractive. Um, we'll talk a little bit about actually then applying these, uh, so we have some specific examples to go through and kind of have these broken down into some different categories, uh, depending on uh, your role in the organization. Um, we'll have a little bit also just on, on technical and financial help that's going to be available. Um, through uh, the Energy Trust of Oregon, PGE. And we'll just summarize and talk about a few next steps that, uh, to go out and uh, help implement these things. So if, before we get into that, uh, I want to take a moment here and, and uh, let anyone who's on the, on the webinar today um, just use your annotating tools to, uh, to mark here uh, on these checkboxes, what kind of systems you have in your facility. Uh, that'll give us an idea of, you know, what, what we're working with today. So... Uh, I wanted to remind folks, Aaron, that um, if they tuned in after I gave them instructions, they can act to, uh, open their annotating tools by clicking on the little marker underneath the Quick Start tab in the upper left-hand corner. Okay. So... Like we've got some compressed air, pretty good mix. And of course, if you have something else that's uh, that's not listed here, um, you know, just let us know in the in the chat. Just give you a moment. So. Okay. Well, looks like a pretty good uh, list there. So, okay. We'll go here. I have another point of input that I'd like you to share with me. Uh, just what your role is within within your organization. So, uh, same thing here. Just can I make a mark there on the on the slide. It's got an operator, consultant, sustainability manager, maintenance. Selfies. Okay. So Looks like we got a kind of a some good diversity in in the roles here today. So that'll I think we'll have some some things that will apply to to all of all of you on the call. Thank you for that. All right. So we want to talk off first just about the value of O and M improvements. Um, as I mentioned, these are uh, generally considered. You know, low-cost changes, things that we can do with our existing equipment, um, whether it be a uh, set point change, new control strategy, um, different maintenance practices, and so on. So these are all very, usually pretty quick-hitting changes that, uh, that we can do with existing systems for low or no cost. And why would we want to focus on these? Obviously, the, the low cost is, is, is attractive. Um, 
Uh, but another aspect of these is, is going to be just the, the fact that we can do them quickly. Uh, sometimes within organizations, it's, it can be harder and a more time-consuming process to go through and to get approval for, uh, for bigger projects. So these are things that we can, we can do uh, generally on a, on a quicker timeline and get uh, immediate results. Uh, we often see that this kind of focus can lead to more, uh, just better reliability uh, and operation of systems, even safety. Uh, and in my uh, specialty of refrigeration, I see that a lot with um, improving maintenance practices leading to better, uh, better safety. Uh, and uh, last point there, uh, there are uh, incentives available through Energy Trust of Oregon to help uh, fund some of these some of these changes. So that's uh, that can can help that move along even better. And here's an we just want to talk through an example of of the how these these small changes and sometimes big changes, but let's look at a small one how that can play out over time, uh, given. Uh, you know, something pretty close to typical uh, industrial rates around here, uh, about five cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, what happens when we save, you know, save five kilowatts? You know, that could be, you know, a small pump or a, a blower or something like that, uh, or maybe just a small change in a set point on your compressed air system. Uh, so just for one day, you can see 120 kilowatt hours and that we're going to save six dollars there. If we can persist in something like this for uh, a year, you can see, you know, adds up pretty quickly to a couple thousand dollars. And uh, over the life, you know, extending that out to a decade, uh, adding up to you know, over twenty thousand. So, you know, a pretty small change uh, over time can can really add up to uh, a lot of a lot of savings in the end. And it's interesting too, I think, to think about, you know, the cost of ownership of, of something that might be consuming five kilowatts. Uh, that that device may have cost considerably less than, than twenty thousand dollars. So, just something to keep in mind on the cost of ownership of anything that's consuming energy. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, with that, we're going to go into some some specific examples of O&M best practices, and we're going to talk about them in terms of how they might apply to different people within an organization. We'll start off with some uh, that, that we think can apply to pretty much anyone who's working around systems that consume energy. Uh, then we'll move into items that are specific to uh, individuals actually taking care of equipment, as opposed to uh, we'll have a separate topic for those who are operating that equipment from day to day. And we have a couple examples of, of some things that uh, maybe involve timing uh, of, of our use of equipment and, uh, and management topics as well. So in those best practices for everyone, we have these, these examples uh, starting off with minimizing loads. Obviously, any time we can we can uh, remove load from a system that's going to uh, open up an opportunity to save energy. Uh, eliminating leaks, of course, uh, anytime we're you know, generating pressure or flow, uh, we want to make sure that that's going where we need it and not to leaks. Turning things off is one of my favorite, but pretty, pretty obvious, but sometimes uh, gets left undone. So I look at some examples there. Uh, only using energy when and where needed. This is kind of implies that you know we've got items out there, equipment that maybe is is, uh, is just being misapplied. Um, so uh, there's some some examples we'll look at. Uh, making the most of our control systems is uh, is another area that we focus on and looking for O and M improvements and uh, undoing those manual overrides that we we often see out there in the industry. So some examples here, let's talk about uh, minimizing loads. You know, we've got a, an example here of just a, a warehouse that's, that's being heated, uh, and obviously you can see that's in the wintertime. Uh, 
and uh, we've got a we've got an exhaust fan running there. So in this case, it turns out that exhaust uh, was supposed to be blocked up for the winter, but uh, it just never never happened. And uh, we're I think we're about we're ranging down about as low as minus 20 um, in this location at the time, and it was about 85 degrees in this in the ceiling. So obviously that's going to put some more heat load on the system. So things like this we want to want to look for. Uh, got another example here in uh, in a refrigerated warehouse. Uh, looking at door heaters, you can see above these doors we've got some uh, heat lamps, and uh, in this case you know, we had uh, just the door heat to keep these doors from frosting or sweating, uh, adding up to eight percent of the facility energy use. So. That's pretty significant in a facility where you've got a, uh, a large refrigeration system. So this, the solution here was to look at uh, cycle, uh, cycle timers and uh, can, we, can we adjust those to where they're, they're running less time, less total time and still achieving uh, what we want to do with them to prevent, uh, pre prevent frosting of those doors. Uh, here's a, an example. I know we had several compressed air systems, it looked like, on the, from the attendees uh, of a, a compressed air application. You can see uh, a, a photo eye here that's part of a production line and uh, an air nozzle that's being used to keep that, that photo eye clear of debris. Uh, so what was done here uh, was, you know, we looked at controls to actually just pulse that air so it's not running continuously but rather just um, just when needed so uh, another uh, change was to just reduce that uh, the pressure of that air so anytime we reduce the pressure uh, that's going to open blowing uh, we're going to reduce the mass flow and that's going to translate to less load on our on our compressors so any kind of open blowing is always an opportunity to look at at uh, both controlling it and reducing the pressure that we're providing to that to that open blowing. Our second topic for everyone: uh, eliminating leaks. This is the leaks can take many forms. Uh, we've got some some listed here: heat leaks. Uh, you know, if you're heating a space, uh, we've got a steam system. I'm always looking for those. Internal leaks are, can be uh, maybe not so obvious, but um, you know things like uh, regulators or uh, any time we've got uh, maybe say a uh, hydronic system uh, where we where we're leaking um, either from you know hot to cold or high pressure to low pressure uh, those those sorts of leaks um, that maybe don't you know not as obvious as a, a water leak that's running on the floor but can definitely lead to some some inefficiency. Um, specifically, water leaks. You know, if we're if we're heating or, or cooling that water, we're going to not only lose the water, but uh, whatever energy we put into conditioning that. So those can be um, some double savings there to address compressed air leaks. I'm sure anyone who has been around compressed air systems knows that uh, we can have a significant amount of of our uh, compressed air production going to leaks. Uh, and figures, you know, range, depending on who you're reading, you know, we, I've, I've seen figures from 20 to 50 percent on uh, total uh, leak loads uh, in compressed air systems. So obviously repairing those leaks is going to be uh, the number one action to addressing them, but I think in a bigger bigger picture we need to look at um, tracking any repairs that are done and looking, identifying those areas that are uh, are prone to leaks. So you have components that that are repeatedly developing leaks and looking for alternatives. Another uh, uh, method that's used to address uh, leaks or to reduce their impact is to look at uh, do you know do you have particular areas of your system that are not continuously in use and can those be can those be isolated when they're not in use so any leaks in those 
areas would would be would be stopped. Uh, another area that we're looking at here would be the I mentioned earlier one of my favorites just turn it off. You know this can can be really uh, any number of of things lighting uh, equipment um, uh, just uh, whatever happens to be plugged into electricity that doesn't need to be used continuously. And so we look at you know when uh, you know when specifically can that be equipment be turned off. Um, so, you know, things like consolidating operation really kind of cross over probably into the management category, but, um, you know, those are the kinds of things we need to think about in uh, you know, identifying those things we can turn off. Uh, if you have access to your uh, real, you know, trending of your real-time energy use, uh, that can be a, a great uh, Great way to identify you know, what what's that what's that baseline energy that's going on um, that base load when there's when you're out of production or or vacant um, and so once you know that you know, start to think about well what what composes that that energy is it is it HVAC is it lighting you know and start to really investigate where that energy is coming from. And you know, it's likely that um, you know that can't be eliminated, but hopefully reduced some. So there's another example we can see there of you know some some loading loading lights on a on a dock that are, are not doing much useful lighting, as you can see in that picture. Um, here's another example of of where we can turn something off. Um, you can see in this picture, uh, uh, um, well, I, I guess we're moving into when and where needed, uh, similar to turn it off. But in this case, we've got you know a light that, that really doesn't have any, any purpose uh, just up above um, stacks of, of pallets here. So uh, in this case, you know, the, the fix would be to, to just uh, disconnect those, those fixtures. Uh, talking about control systems, uh, this is another area that where we can make a lot of progress in uh, O and M uh, savings. We like to think of control systems as a tool. Uh, often, you know, when I come into a facility, control system may have been just sort of set up and, and left alone. I uh, want to make sure that we're really taking advantage of any features that that we've got in those control systems. Um, interesting thing that happens sometimes too is if we've got, especially if we have good trend data in a control system, they can kind of give us some insights into what's happening over time in in those uh, in those systems, and we can look for, say, you know, are we seeing in increased operation of a system at times when you know when we compare that to our operations, it just doesn't seem appropriate. And it can be the you know spark some investigation to look into what's uh, what's what's bringing about that additional usage. It can be a convenient way to make uh, seasonal adjustments as well. Uh, regarding buried set points, uh, we see this often, and you know, we we may have a, a a user interface that gives us uh, limited access to uh, to. Different uh, control features, and um, you know, we just want to want to identify those things that potentially we could um, we could look at uh, changing that we don't normally have access to. Somewhat related to controls, we've got this topic of undoing manual overrides. Um, so anytime you know, if you're if you're looking at uh, handoff auto switches, or if a piece of equipment has a, a local uh, and a remote mode, uh, or manual mode, we want to look for those instances of uh, <coughs> excuse me of uh, you know controls that have been that have been put into a manual operating mode. And 
you know, again, we got another one here from, from a cold storage uh, where some, some product is blocking open a, a freezer door so that, um, so that people can, you know, move more quickly through the door, apparently. So that, that, that's going to lead to a lot of excess load and other problems in the system. Um, so we want to look at, you know, the, is that a cultural issue? Is there a problem with the door? Uh, and start to ask questions about, you know, why that's happening. Uh, you know, in, in general, you know, why do, why do things get, get put into hand op manual mode? Uh, this is most often, I think, coming from, uh, you know, as a temporary measure. Uh, maybe uh, there was a problem in, in, in the system and, and, and as part of troubleshooting, things were put into manual mode uh, to force, force operation so that production continue, can continue until a proper fix uh, can be made. And then what happens sometimes is that those manual overrides just get left in place. So um, you know, we want to look for those as they, as they crop up. So there's a few examples of just, you know, these are, these are general areas where we, can, where we can find and look for uh, O&M savings. And what I'd like to do here is uh, you know, give, give you the opportunity to maybe share with the group uh, if there were if some of these ring a bell for you and you know, maybe you've applied them in your own operation. So just give a minute here. You can either uh, just uh, use your chat um, to uh, ask Beth to unmute you or maybe type, type in a quick example. Aaron, um, while we're waiting for other people to share, I do have one um, one attendee shared something with me. Um, I've been a maintenance supervisor for about three years and have looked around to see where there were some areas to save energy. We have lights in our stairwells that were on all the time, so we installed motion sensors to turn them off and on as needed. Great. That's a... That's a good example of, you know, an item that it's kind of a common use. There's no specific owner to those lights in a stairwell. Uh, it's not like somebody's personal office or something like that. And, and those are areas I think where we see things, you know, tend to get left on. So any other examples out there? Yep, I just got one. Uh, reduce overall temperature of data center by finding and fixing the few devices running hot. Interesting. And one more. We have adjusted the timing to shorter periods on our occupancy sen sensors. Yeah, that's a good one, um, especially, you know, now with uh, LEDs becoming more prevalent, uh, they're going to be much more tolerant to lower, uh, to more switching. So uh, we see a lot shorter delay times coming about. You know, with fluorescence, we, if you go by the manufacturer, you, you're going to be limited to generally, you know, 15 minutes, uh, five minutes in some cases, 30 minutes in others. So uh, with LEDs, we can we can be going to much shorter delay times. The, the main limitation just being uh, annoying lights sort of flashing on and off too much. <laughs> we have a, one example from our Energy Trust representative that said that um, they have many industrial customers who run their cooling towers a little harder to take the load off the chillers. Yes, that's a, that's a good one. Any, any time we're, we're bringing down uh, condensing temperature, essentially, we're that, that the compressor in that chiller is going to have a, a lower discharge pressure to work against any time we can bring down uh, those, those uh, condensing temperatures. So very good. Well, I think that's we're settled down there. Very good. Thank you for those examples. So we'll move into here some a few best practices for maintenance. Uh, we've got some examples of 
uh, looking at uh, cleanliness, where are some areas that we can look look at uh, that uh, that's going to help reduce energy usage, uh, pressure drop, of course, uh, fixing equipment that's that's not working, and what can we do with calibrations? Are we are we getting are the numbers that we're seeing uh, real? So efficiency through cleanliness. Uh, this mostly applies to you know, we're looking at uh, heat transfer uh, devices, so surfaces could be, uh, you know, things that have coils like this condenser, uh, and then, uh, you know, clogging of uh, filters or strainers or other similar devices. So uh, here you can see an example of a, uh, this is a, a pump strainer that's obviously been left uh, probably a little bit too long before cleaning, mostly full of plastic bags and pieces of rubber belt and bugs. Uh, so not a lot of flow getting through. And you can see the result of that here at a condenser where uh, we've got multiple issues going on. For one, there's low flow, uh, but also you can see uh, nozzles have, they've got you know, nozzles that are completely plugged or, or only letting a small amount of water through and resulting in a dry dry tube bundle in this case. So if you're, uh, if you're using, this is, again goes back to that condensing uh, comment that was just made. You know, we're, we're going to run high, high condensing here. Our compressors are going to have to work harder. Anytime we're trying to achieve a, some kind of a set point, if, if our heat transfer surfaces are, are fouled, we're going to have to work harder. So, um, Minimizing pressure drop. So the question here, you know, does this pressure drop influence your system set point? And if it's not, you know, that's it's probably not going to save you a lot of energy to address it. But in the case of, you know, let's say we're talking about, um, you know, a compressed air filter or something like that, uh, we, you know, we can look at undersized components. You know, maybe we've got. Um, uh, you know that, uh, that filter that's creating additional pressure drop. Uh, if it's creating a five-pound pressure drop, and we can get that down to, you know, one pound, um, you know, that, that's four pounds of pressure that our compressor doesn't have to make, and we can still achieve the same pressure out in our system. So you know, things like like low pressure drop filters, just larger or uh, larger components. If you got some. Uh, valve that's undersized, things like that to look for. So the question there, you know, you look at, you know, what is your compressor uh, producing as, in terms of pressure, and then you know, what do you actually need out in the plant? And if there's a big difference between those two numbers, then that's time to start looking at, you know, what's, what's causing that. So uh, to take our compressed air example here, we've we've got one that would be a a five a five pound pressure drop. So however we're we're getting that through um, you know through our filters or dryers or what have you. Uh, what what's going to happen if we if we can reduce that by by five pounds on a on a thousand cfm of flow. So we've got some rules of thumb built into this calculation here. Here's our five pounds. And for typical systems, uh, we see every, about every, every pound that we can reduce that pressure, we're going to save about half a percent on our compressor. And we're going to multiply that by the flow. And uh, we've got another kind of rule of thumb here of about one horsepower per CFM. That we see in typical systems, or sorry, one four four point three uh, CFM per per horsepower, and we're going to convert roughly convert our kilowatts to uh, our uh, horsepower and our horsepower to kilowatts, and we apply one year of time, so eight thousand seven hundred sixty hours, with a, an energy rate. Over, a little over six cents there, six and a half cents, and you can see that's uh, you know coming in just over twenty six hundred dollars a year on a five 
five pound reduction. So, you know, pretty small change on a, you know, modest compressed air system there, uh, resulting in, you know, uh, some adding up to some some savings there. And our next topic here, looking at fixing equipment that's not working. So this this can be any number of things, uh, you know, equipment that's designed to save energy but turned off. I'll call it the, you know, the the California VFD. You know, I see, go, the, it's code down there to apply VFDs to a lot of things that you know you might not see in other areas, and we often just see. They put put in the VFD because they have to, but it just runs at 100%, right? So the var variable speed, uh, we're not taking advantage of that variable speed. Um, or maybe just the, the B VFD was bypassed, you know, for, for some reason. Um, uh, <clears throat> worn out equipment, uh, you know, we see this. Uh, I was just uh, at a customer the other day, and had a had a compressor that ran high motor current, and it turns out that it just uh, it had it had gone well beyond its uh, its rebuild time, and it, and it was uh, just just worn out. Uh, you know, bearing the bearings were actually failing and uh, uh, causing it to consume more energy. Failed valves and regulators, uh, of course, those can lead to uh, restrictions in the system or or internal leaks that we were talking about earlier. Measuring in the wrong place. Uh, this could be, you know, it goes back to our control system, but, you know, think about a, uh, if you're controlling temperature in a space and maybe the, the temperature probe is, is, uh, is located uh, in, a, in an area that, uh, you know, is getting, you know, maybe next to a window or a door or something like that, causing your system to run. Um, Manufacturer defects. You know, we like to think that when we get new equipment, it's going to work the way it's supposed to. But sometimes, out of the box, we see uh, equipment that's not beha or behaving or performing how it should. Um, and uh, you know, just just any number of things that you see uh, that where equipment has has stopped working in the way it was originally designed. Calibrations are another big area that we look at for O&M savings. Um, generally, you know, temperatures and pressures are, are an area that we look at a lot. Um, obviously, if you're if you're cooling something, and the the temperature that you're reading is warmer than actual, then you're probably going to be cooling more than you need to, and vice versa for a heating application. Uh, obviously, pressures. You know, if you uh, go back to our compressed air system, if if the uh, if your control system is reading a lower pressure than actual, your your system is going to be operating at artificially high pressure. Motor current. You know, we see this in um, in systems. You know, where say you have multiple compressors operating on the same system, and uh, generally, those will have some kind of protection to prevent them from uh, from burning up their motor at high amps, and uh, you know, those need to be accurate so that we're not limiting operation of compressors, which would lead to maybe running more compressors. So, if, you know, if we can get by on two compressors, but are they're not fully able to load, so we're running three, would be you know how that would play out. Uh, related to that, same thing with capacity indicators. You know, if you've got uh, a line of compressors and you know there's some inaccuracy in what they're indicating on capacity, you you may be in a situation where you've got multiple uh, items, you know, pieces of equipment unloaded, and if those can be brought to full load, you know maybe we can we can turn one of those items off. And I won't say that's always the case. Some some equipment is works better. You know, if we're, we're talking about like variable speed fans or something like that. Is better to share load, but other items would maybe don't want to want to do that. 
So here's an example of you know what uh, how a calibration uh, on a capacity indicator would um, actually uh, look, this would be a this is a motor current calibration. Sorry, uh, we can see on this graph uh, we're looking at capacity along the horizontal axis versus power, and you can see this this uh, compressor really never reaches full load, uh, at least on the indicator. But the uh, but the percent power is reading uh, reading high, so we can see that this this hook here on the on the curve that's indicating that the this compressor is its force unloading itself. So um, if you're in a multiple compressor system, uh, you're not getting the capacity out of this machine, and you're more likely to need to run additional equipment. So here we've got some uh, some best practices for operators. These are the folks that are running the equipment day to day. So first, um, we kind of related to you know minimizing the amount of equipment running. Um, is it possible to shift shift the load to a smaller unit? You know we've got a, in our images here a, a multiple. You know, compressors versus you know one small compressor, right? Uh, you know, maybe uh, that could be. Uh, I think an example I can think of in a you know facilities with big compressed air systems that don't run 24/7, but maybe have a fire fire suppression system or some some small uh, compressed air load that that they need to keep online you know, when they're not in production. So can does it make sense to you know to turn off the big the big compressed air system and go down to just you know a minimal uh, unit? Um, you know this, is, this can be related to load reduction. You know if we start looking at reducing loads and you get to the point where you know we're we're in a you know partly loaded on a on a bigger system, can we can we shift then down as a result of those load reductions to a smaller unit than we're used to running? And another part of this too is what tolerance do you have in your system for uh, for short-term, you know, uh, periods where maybe the parameters are outside of what you would normally want. You know, maybe your um, your compressed air pressure you know, is going to drop below temporarily, drop below that set point for during uh, peak usage. Um, can you tolerate that? Or and uh, maybe run a smaller unit. Choosing the best part load option. So uh, if you've got, you know, let's say, um, you know, a variable speed unit versus throttling, you know, for to continue with our compressed air example, uh, this could apply, of course, to pumps or fans or other items that, that we have to part load. Um, you can see here uh, we've got a line drawn, dotted line drawn for representing the one-to-one -one capacity to power relationship. And the best uh, kind of common approach that we see out there would be, you know, speed control. So uh, you can see we get pretty close to that one-to-one -one, uh, line there. And as and th you know, this we're looking at uh, really. Air compressors here on this example. Uh, when we go to a load unload system where we're the, con the compressor continuously runs, but um, we're operating between a, in a pressure dead band and pumping up a, a tank, you know, letting in unloading the compressor so it drops to minimal power uh, while the tank bleeds down, and then just repeating that process. So we get a pretty good part load curve from that. Uh, we got to be careful that can. That can vary depending on wh how well executed that part load system is. Uh, then we go to uh, a combination of throttling and and low unload. So for the top part of capacity, we're actually just throttling, and then we get to a point and unload. And then our our throttling, straight throttling, where you can see you know we're approaching you know we're approaching 70% power. Um, while we're not doing any capacity.
so in this case, uh, what should we run here? Well, this will be some, some audience participation. If you can you grab your annotation tools and check off uh, on this question. So if you've got a, a, a weekend load of 50% and you're running one, you only need to run one compressor, uh, which one would you want to run? So, yeah, we're seeing that. Yeah, the variable speed compressor is definitely going to be lower power. So right here at our about 50% capacity, we can see, uh, you know, we're about 50% power on the variable speed versus about 80% power on our throttling machine. Sorry, load unload would be uh, about uh, a little over 60% power. So variable speed definitely wins there. How about our uh, if we if we're closer to 90% load? So we're over here, and uh, you know we're going to compare variable speed to uh, to load unload. Yeah, maybe uh, got one vote for uh, for load unload. Got a question mark. Yeah, that's. I think. Um, I think the, the question mark represent it pretty well. It it probably you know it doesn't matter too much if you're staying right around that 90% load. But if you if you think you're going to be running closer to full load, you'll probably want to go to the load unload machine just because you know you, at at full load you're going to be dealing with drive losses. Um, but if you think you might tend to be a little bit lower than the 90, you probably want to go with the variable speed. So, uh, a few items on best practices for timing and management here. Um, in our minimizing equipment idle time, uh, you know, this is this c can often come down to you know looking at uh, delays. You know, is there a delay in in the time it takes to turn off equipment at the end of production? Or is the equipment being turned on, uh, you know, well before production starts? We see uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a bakery in the image here. Uh, seen this in bakeries where, you know, maybe there's some ovens and ventilation and things like that that kind of tend to run all the time, whether you're baking or not, and that can be brought down, maybe not turned off, but at least brought down to a lower level uh, when when you're not actively using that equipment. Uh, somebody mentioned early minim minimizing occupancy sensor times. It's a great, great example. Um, you know, if you've got uh, a batch process, maybe that you can um, consolidate and and run, uh, you know, maybe uh, something that's being stretched out. You know, if you can consolidate that to uh, to a single operation. Only doing things when needed uh, is another example here for timing. Uh, we've got an example here of a just a this is a defrost clock that uh, that just runs uh, all the time, and you've got four pins in it, so you're going to defrost four times a day, no matter what. Um, you know, a solution to this might be to put in a uh, a better controller or uh, modify this one so that it, it just it only runs when when the Units actually refrigerating. So if you got a if you got a walk-in cooler or something like that, it's probably it's a good chance that it has a timer that looks like this. Um, doing things at the most advantageous time. Uh, this you know we've got an example here of, of watering. You know maybe not necessarily an energy thing, but uh, you know watering at times. You know when you're not Hot and windy outside we reduce evaporation losses. Um, if you've got a you know, warehouse, maybe or something that you're conditioning, can you can you use outside air to to pre-cool? You know those sorts of things. Um, for management, we've got this one of rethinking standards. So. Uh, you know, looking for those parameters that maybe date back to uh, 
a previous operation where maybe uh, standards were different or you had different equipment. Um, you know, we've got one here of an example in, the, in a paper machine, you know, in the, the vacuum levels uh, being uh, maybe going by old requirements or, or just uh, overly conservative requirements, space temperatures, humidity. So, you know, you just have to ask, you know, what do you, what do you really need? Uh, how, how close can you go to that, to that point? Are there, are there risks? Of uh, you know of, of exceeding that that level. So uh, anybody on the call have an example of of some of those things that maybe you've been able to do within your operation? Again, uh, you know we can just chat or chime in with any of those. I have one here um, as people have a chance to respond. Um, as part of a continuous improvement program, now we have our production teams reevaluate the procedures on a quarterly basis uh, with regards to reducing energy. Good, yeah, that's that's good to, you know, I think go, go back and revisit those things so they don't kind of become set in stone over time and really look at what the current needs are. And then we just got another one. Um, we run our sprinkler system for the grounds from midnight to 6 a.m. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Maybe not not today, but uh, maybe not not water at all today, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing okay. anymore. So that looks like it. All right. Okay, so now um, you know, we've hopefully you've got some good ideas from those. Uh, we can at least plant a seed, and you can go back and maybe look at look for some opportunities relating to those items. And I'm going to turn it over to Greg Nelson uh, to talk about uh, energy trust incentives here for a moment. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, like Aaron said, my name is Greg Nelson. I'm a program delivery contractor with Energy Trust of Oregon's Industry and Agricultural Program. I and other PDCs like me work with industrial and agricultural businesses of all types and sizes, and we help these customers take advantage of Energy Trust technical assistance and cash incentives to control energy costs year over year. Your, your PDC can help you find opportunities in compressed air, fan, and pumping systems, and a wide variety of other equipment at your site. In fact, anytime you're considering an equipment purchase of any kind, you can reach out to your PDC and ask if there's any incentives to help you. For commercial customers uh, with existing facilities, you can also be served by Energy Trust through their existing buildings program. As with the industrial program, Energy Trust provides energy experts to understand your facilities and, and help you save energy at your sites. In addition to a wide variety of incentive opportunities for lighting and HVAC upgrades, uh, this program can also help you control costs in your computer server rooms and other areas where you may not have even considered yet. And then finally, uh, if you're planning on building a new facility, Energy Trust has technical services to help you too there. I want to thank you all for uh, attending this webinar and, and thank you for your interest in energy savings. So with that, I will turn it over to Beth. Actually, I actually think Aaron's okay, going to take yeah. it back, but thank you, Greg. All right. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so just in summary, uh, you know, we talked about what are our own improvements and why we want to focus on them. I think the big push there is that they're low cost, and uh, you know, we can we can achieve some some hopefully quick savings um, with minimal uh, minimal investment. Uh, we talked about how how some of these oper opportunities can apply to different people within an organization depending on their role. Uh, and gave several examples, and uh, Greg just uh, just gave us um, some information on incentives. So I encourage you to pursue those if if you're if you're going after uh, these opportunities. So next steps, uh, you know, take what you hear you've learned here, and and just go back. Uh, you know, share these with your energy team. Uh, you know, look for those those opportunities, and as you're doing that, think about 
how you're going to uh, make these changes persist. That's probably one of the, the one downside of, of O&M is that it left alone, things tend to go back where they were. So think about how you can make them stick and uh, bounce these off of ideas off of your representatives with PGE and Energy Trust. And contact PGE for a free energy consultation. Okay. Well, thank you, Aaron. Um, I just wanted to let people know that, as Aaron said, and Greg said, PGE and the Energy Trust do provide free energy efficiency consultations to assist you. And if you're learning, uh, excuse me, if you're interested in learning more, you can contact us through um, the numbers written on the screen here, portlandgeneral.com forward slash business, or you can reach out directly to Paula Conway and she will hook you up with the correct uh, program delivery or management contractor. And now before we proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar, I'd like to remind you that you can continue to submit questions to me through chat and I will ask them of the instructor. And I want to go to the first question, which is, how much energy can be saved by fixing compressed air leaks? Okay. Compressed air leaks, as I mentioned, you know, depending on your system, uh, you know, we can we see leak rates of, you know, 20 to 50 percent. So, if you've got good part load efficiency, maybe you have a good sequencer and variable speed, uh, you know, we you could pretty much say proportionally, you know, depending on how late, low you can get that leak load. Uh, so it might be, you know, anywhere from say 10 to to 30% of your compressed air energy use. Uh, and if you're going to do go that route, I really encourage you to, to, uh, to make it a formal program that gets repeated uh, on a regular basis, maybe an, at least annually, and to maintain those savings. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, if if I turn equipment off only to start it again 10 minutes later, doesn't, the cy doesn't cycling the equipment just cause more energy use or increase peak demand due to starting current? Yeah, that's, that's a question that comes up often uh, when we talk about cycling equipment. And it's true that uh, anytime you, you know, if you're just starting something across the line, you're going to have a, uh, a peak uh, current that happens at that time. Uh, the the reason why we don't get concerned about that causing additional energy or or peak usage is just because of the it, it's taking place over such a short time. We're talking about a fraction of a second, generally. So uh, energy being the accumulation of that power, you know, usage over time. So if we energy is time versus time multiplied by power. Uh, the time is just so short uh, that it, we, we really don't, we're not going to pick that up on, on your utility meter in a noticeable way. And the same, if we're talking about peak demand, peak demand is generally, uh, I want to say most places around, it's, it's based on a 15 minute average. So if your peak current is occurring for just a fraction of a second, that's again not going to, not going to register on your meter in a way that that, uh, that would affect your peak demand. So now that said, we want to be concerned about any, uh, about excessively cycling mo in motors uh, and causing them to overheat. So you, you want to consult maybe the NEMA uh, maximum starts per hour table or for bigger motors, talk to your, talk to the motor manufacturer. Thank you, Aaron. The next question is how often, no, excuse me, that's not the next question. What is the typical payback for O&M projects? Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, most of the time it's going to be short. I mean, in my experience of doing a lot of O&M consulting, it's, I would say, you know, often in that six months to a year or, you know, less than a year uh, payback, sometimes pretty much instantly, you know, on the no-cost things. Um, you know, changing a set point or something like that, um, but generally pretty short, short paybacks on 
on O and M. Thank you. And the other question that I accidentally asked too early is how often should we calibrate our gauges? Okay, so gauges, um, again, you know, I would say they're at least annually, you know, if, uh, if we're talking about our, you know, gauges going in our controls. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe you can go down from there if it's more, if it's something more critical. But, uh, you know, most, most places I'm dealing with are, are doing that on an annual basis. Well, thank you, Aaron. That was our last question, and thank you all for joining us today.